Hello everyone, I'm Nina Gopal. Welcome to Global Express, where we discuss developments in our neighborhood, in our backyard that have an impact on India. This week, we're taking a closer look at the shocking death of the Iranian President, Pre President Ibrahim Raisi, and his India-leaning Foreign Minister, Hussein Amr Abdullian, in a helicopter crash days after India pulled off a strategic coup in gaining a firm foothold in Iran with the Chabahar 40. How will a change of regime affect India? How does it affect Iran, where a smooth transfer of power from the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei to Ibrahim Raisi set for this June was on the cards? In a world where there are no coincidences, we ask, Raisi's fiery end, was it bad weather mm. or was it foul play? Was it really an accident or was it a planned assassination? And who was behind it? Iran's sworn enemy? <clears throat> Israel's Mossad or the CIA deep, deep state, and where does that leave India? Uh, walking a tightrope, caught in a precarious balancing act in West Asia. Talking to Global Express today over the speculation that it wasn't just bad weather but foul play, internal or external, that led to President Raisi's death and a possible vacuum at the very top in Iran are two West Asia experts. Ambassador Anil Tribunyat is a distinguished fellow at Vivekananda Foundation. He served as India's ambassador of India to Jordan and Libya and worked in the West Asia and Gulf and Hajj divisions in the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi as well. Welcome, Ambassador. We also have well-known journalist, Dr. Wael Awad. He's a South Asia expert who's covered wars in Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, and of course, covered every imaginable conflict in West Asia. Welcome, Dr. Awad. Thank you, Let's Tom. start with... Let's start with the conspiracy theories behind the helicopter crash and the fact that while outside Iran, among the diaspora, the Iranian diaspora in Germany and Canada, there isn't much mourning. Quite the opposite, in fact, there's celebration. There's also some hope, which I believe is misplaced, that the death of such a powerful figure will bring change. Is that even a possibility? Could it set off any kind of regime change from below? As for the conspiracy theories, Israel has said it has nothing to do with Raisi's death. They said it wasn't us. The U.S. says it has no idea. Can we start with you, Dr. Awad? As there is another theory, fingers are being pointed at Ali Khamenei's son, Mojtaba, who's one of the contenders for the all-powerful position of supreme leader. Is there a rift in the theocracy about a family member succeeding Ali Khamenei? Well, uh, thank you, Nina. I, I believe you also lived in the West Asia. And uh, in West Asia, I'm, we do not believe in the conspiracy theory, but nor we believe also a coincidence is happening in the Middle East. So therefore, we can mm -hmm. always imagine that there is something or the other. There, are, there is no fire. There is no smoke without the fire. So therefore, yeah. there is something to, uh, to, to talk about. But having said that, I will still go by the virgins of the bad weather and the waiting for the full investigation to find out. But what are the other factors contributing to what you have said is absolutely, uh, could be a, a figures that people may think. But I don't think that the Mujtaba of the Supreme Leader's son is waiting for the, uh, the president to go to the border to uh, go and kill him. You know, you know, you can kill anybody anywhere you want. And uh, it's very mysteriously died. Anything can happen. So I don't think that could be the theory of that. But let us say, because uh, bringing down a helicopter uh, in a bad weather, it's very simple, very easy for a state to do that, not by a group at all. It is the reason why I'm mm -hmm. saying so, because you need the technology, which is a new technology, upgrading of the uh, helicopters, the choppers of the B-212, that can cause some sort of, you know, uh, laser or could be uh, some, some kind of upgrading from the sky that you can deflect the radar or do something to the radar. And it's very simple and very easy for the helicopter to crash and kill whoever is on board because it's flying at very high. So therefore, there are so many things to say to uh, the, the sudden demise of both the president and the, uh, uh, and the foreign, foreign minister, minister and, and six other officials. In fact, uh, the timing of it is uh, quite important for all of us to think and doubt about the things, because this happened also after Israeli retaliated for the attack of Iran uh, on attacking the, uh, uh, the Iranian consulate in Syria and killing their officials, and also because of Gaza war taking place and because of Azerbaijan, uh, is also is the largest base of Israeli intelligence and military bases is 
in, in Azerbaijan. So all these factors... That, that is actually a very interesting aspect, uh, Dr. Abad, don't you think? The fact that Azerbaijan is actually an ally of Israel. Well, that is what the people uh, are the, trying to expose because even before the 7th of October, there was rumors and some intelligence report that there are some kind of a sabotage or attack covert operation to be carried through Azerbaijan because against Iranian nuclear installation. But uh, I think uh, Azerbaijan tried with this dam uh, inauguration at the border uh, is was a good gesture by the Iranian. That's why we saw the yeah. president and the foreign minister coming together in a way to rapprochement between the two states. That's very interesting. But you know, you, so just to go back to the former foreign minister, Iranian foreign minister Javad Zarif's uh, comment, he said that he's put the blame, he's put the onus on America. He said it was American sanctions which prevented these uh, aviation parts from being brought in to upgrade and repair and keep uh, the uh, Bell helicopters going. That is behind the crash. I mean, did the deep state, so to speak, I mean, did America want him out? Because in election year, you have uh, you have your universities, uh, you know, filled with student protests, you know, and and Raisi was driving. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, all of Iran was uh, the theocracy was on the same page, but Raisi was the front uh, and center of the uh, you know the way that uh, Iran was pushing itself. Uh, and mending fences, so to speak, with all the major powers in the region, and and challenging Israel uh, at every uh, juncture. I mean, Hamas's uh, uh, attack on uh, Israel on October seventh was uh, clearly, you know, I mean, it may or may not have been sponsored by Iran, but it's been sustained by Iran, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, and so on and so forth. So, do you think that deep state would have wanted to eliminate him at all? I, I said it could be a state involvement. We cannot rule out anybody at this stage. I think that's what I was trying to say. Even Zarif, when he's saying that contributory factors that could be the American spare part, but that doesn't give them a clean carte blanche, uh, you know, clear chat, uh, chat that you don't have responsibility. Why are you flying a president and the, the high dignitaries on, a, on an airplane which is 45 years old? I mean, you could yeah. have also upgraded your system and you don't need it. And besides, you had three helicopters at the same time. Why you flew? I mean, there are lots of intelligent loopholes. There are lots of uh, human errors. Why you fly in a bad weather? I think these are issues we has to be taken very seriously. And Iran has to give the answer to all these doubts in the people's mind. Raisi's ruling, Nina, has been very successful in all the fronts, actually at a very critical juncture in Iranian history. Let us put it mm -hmm. that way. I mean, the oil production of Iran raised to 3.3 billion uh, barrel, a million barrel a day, which was closer to the prior to the American sanction on Iran, which is despite the, uh, the, uh, the, the equipments and the extraction equipment and the, and the maintenance uh, because of the spare parts of the United States, despite the American sanctions on Iranian oil, which is called by the Iranian as a terrorism economic sanctions, all this has been shown a very upsurge of the Iranian oil, especially with the looking east policy or act east policy. They have strengthened their relation with India, with China and with the rest of Asia. This is one of the contributory factors of him and he has really achieved. Secondly, also, we, we, did, we did see the economic the growth in the economy, 4.3 and 3.2, 3.5 throughout the three years of his uh, tenure. We noticed that there was an improving, despite also the fact of the harsh. Was that, the was that of, driven by him? Was that driven by him? Well, he is the president. He's, he's running a government, which maybe was the eye of the supreme leadership watching it. But definitely it was he has a, he has the force and the vision to drive the economy forward. And secondly, you know, he was the country which also negotiating the deal with the United States to come back in terms for the nuclear deal. And then they attacked yeah. in, uh, Israel for the first time in the history. Iran has had, had a direct confrontation with Israel after the retaliatory attack. So all this has shown that Iran was in the, tri in the right track. I also joined joining with the Shanghai organization, with the BRICS uh, uh, summits are taking place, and the uh, North-South uh, corridors, all these factors contributed to Raisi uh, ruling in the country. But the internal situation in Iran remained shaky, shaky and shambled because of the economy and the people are facing lots of difficulties. 
you know if i can just go back to the nuclear you know uh, it, it, apparently he was also a very big the big mover and the shaker behind iran's pursuit of nuclear enrichment in a weapons grade level uh, you know and th that is apparently one of the one of the reasons that the uh, that the mullahs uh, respected him because he would not back down on that with with the when the us was uh, you know trying to force iran to stop the uh, nuclear you know enrichment well you see this is a, a state uh, honoring agreement signed by the five plus two with the but the five security council uh, permanent members the united states so they have to honor that nuclear deal with iran and iran was very much adhered to the the agent the nuclear agency which was also doing constant uh, inspections but suddenly you find the president of a, a superpower pulling out of an agreement signed by yeah. his own gov his own government that maybe he different administration but doesn't doesn't that that should not be the policy of any country that you can pull out so iran took a stand and definitely it was meant to melt the united states it has to come in terms it even they told the european who have been trying to open the, the dialogue and economy trades with iran suddenly because of the american sanction and trump and continued during uh, biden tenure we didn't see much of a change in the foreign policy toward iran in fact they hard they hardened the uh, sanctions against iran and against the top leaders because of the uh, gaza war and blaming the proxy wars on from the houthis from south, uh, south lebanon south of lebanon the hezbollah or in syria or in iraq against the uh, israelis uh, on iran so all this have so uh, made would, iran would more israel, would israel have played would israel have played any role in this assassination dr howard because i mean he did he was uh, you know a great uh, proponent of uh, keeping gaza supplied uh, i mean the hamas supplied with weapons and the houthis uh, you know i mean he's he's uh, talked of liberating uh, jerusalem even of al quds even though he's a shia leader well i i really Would don't want go to go as to assassinate assassinate the head of another country even if it's iran wouldn't that be I, an act of war actually definitely it's an act of war and if it is really israel have anything to do with it and for the first time we heard from the israeli's official that they have nothing to do with the assassination of, or the killing of the president so therefore i still i still give the i don't want to go into the conspiracy but that is one of the scenario and that could have been a catastrophe because there will be uh, really a regional war and it could lead to a third world war and and uh, raisi's uh, reputation as a hardliner uh, it does come from the fact that you know i mean he was uh, he did go after the in 1988 apparently he was he got he got the moniker uh, butcher because of the way he cracked down on protesters uh, you know killing hundreds and thousands of people and uh, what is that i mean do you do you see that that kind of a the successor also you know filling those very large shoes i mean does the uh, does the, the supreme leader want another raisi and well, is there another raisi i think nina this is the western discourse against iran for years and raisi happened to be in the jurisdictive system during those years and we know mm. we have been following the iranian Uh, turmoil, and we know how much many people got killed, assassinated. Even a prime minister, even a minister, bombing. More than seventeen thousand Indian died, and the killing of the sabotage done by the internal those organizations. So I don't want to uh, to go, to go and supporting on in this term. But I think there yeah. there is there is there is a truth to the story that he was uh, executing the orders because that was no way that he could escape because there were killing. of innocent iranian as well so but at uh, during his tenure or the other people tenure is the same policy of the mm. iranian uh, islamic revolution uh, uh, republic has carried out in the same manner nothing changed in the policy and he was counted on khamenei because he was considered to be a hardliner and he was even against zarif and all the uh, ministers and the, because of the nuclear deal and he wanted hardline uh, position of iran on this and he was also co uh, considered to be the the successor of uh, khamenei as a, you know the and on the top list and as after khamenei he gave the so who succeed him as the supreme spiritual leader of iran 
So all this can, can be of a contributory factor of the man in the power. But if you look at any uh, revolutionary uh, guards of the Iranian revolution throughout the history from 1979 till date, you notice that all of them were directly involved in establishing an Islamic state in Iran. So that have its pros right. and pros, and, and we can blame anybody on the issues. Why don't we blame the United States for killing Mossadegh in 1951, 52, when he was the yeah. prime minister? And they acknowledge after 30 years. Why only to yeah. squarely blame it on the Iranians when it is their own people? I, having said that, I wouldn't have also said that I would like to clarify my position on this issue that following the Iranian development and the situation on the ground and looking for under despite all these sanctions and the killing of the scientists and regular attacking of officials of the Iranian. I think the Iranian government has to be harsh and had to strengthen its intelligence apparatus to make sure that can safeguard the interests and the people of Iran. That, that's a very interesting point. But who do you see, I mean, in, in, uh, in your eyes, I mean, will uh, Khamenei, uh, you know, choose uh, someone who is more like Raisi? Because uh, very little is known about Makhbar, the uh, Mohammed Makhbar, the, the man who has stepped in as the acting president until the elections. What do you see happening? Are, who are the contenders uh, that are in the uh, race, so to speak? I think it's too early to suggest who will be, but since the election is the 28th of uh, next month, June, there will be some contender coming forward. And Mokhbar is one of the leading figures, and he's also considered to be very close to Khamenei. And he was also one of the guard or the executive of the uh, Khomeini, uh, one organization where he is doing all the work for the, the uh, people there and in oh, his own home city. So there could be, he could be one of the favorite. Uh, currently, at Iran, at this point, it, there is a soft transition. I think after Raisi, there won't be much of a change in the foreign policy. Though the Western world, and we are all watching, that could be some sort of, you know, a U-turn in the Iranian foreign policy. But I, we have seen that that's not much of a change going to happen, whether it's originally or it is the internationally global position of the Iranian. So we need to make sure that uh, the whoever comes to power, definitely he will have the uh, blessing of the supreme leadership. After all, though it is the constitution and 131 of the constitution call for an election or call for the vice president to take over and 50 days after that, 113 of the uh, article of the constitution says that you have to have, you know, the uh, the election. But all of that also we have to take in, 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 in consideration that the supreme leadership have the upper hand despite being a democracy in Iran. I was this just wondering if, if we could if we could uh, look at the uh, the the uh, very interesting fact that uh, the uh, President Ibrahim Raisi was visiting Azerbaijan. Why was he building bridges with a country that was uh, you know that was traditionally so much closer to uh, to Israel and uh, you know than armenia which is which is the country that uh, iran has backed all all of this time what led him to is it was it raisi's move or was it the theocracy itself uh, uh, who feel that they should have they should mend fences with their neighbors well i think that uh, currently if you see that after the disenchantment with the us being the security provider in the region we have seen that more and more countries are trying to find some kind of a modus vivendi with one another. We have seen what happened between Saudi Arabia and Iran in the context of the Yemen war, Houthis, and uh, because with the intervention of the <clears throat> Iraqis, Omanis, and the Chinese, there was a rapprochement that has been created between these two, which shows that the, both the countries are ready uh, to work together. For regional stability. That is number one. Likewise, we have seen the Turkey trying to improve its relations with different uh, countries in the region, be it Saudi Arabia, be it UAE, be it Egypt. And uh, similarly, UAE and Iran and so all these countries are trying to somehow find uh, the way to work together in the region. At the same time, they all realize that there is a problem in their relationship of uh, religious, uh, geo-religious contestation within the region, uh, the certain hegemonistic dimensions of the Iranian policies, 
the, so there is a problem, but at the same time, despite the problem, they've been trying to... So do are you it. saying that the now, is within, also... within Iran itself, within the Iranian government itself, and they were trying to correct this? Very true. I mean, you see, Nagorno-Karabakh has been the problem for quite some time now, where we That's have right. seen the Russians themselves have withdrawn from Armenia a support, mm -hmm. even though it was a part of the CSTO. Uh, and they let the Azerbaijan take over that part uh, with, the, with their support, rather, in a way, because Russia and Turkey want to continue together. Now, Turkey and Azerbaijan uh, are very close there. Likewise, they have been buying a lot of equipment and technology and have intelligence cooperation with Israel. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, if you see, Azerbaijan and uh, Iran are also uh, neighbors. I mean, in Iran, you have something called East Azerbaijan, where which he were visiting, and they were working this dam. Uh, I mean, they have completed this dam, which they inaugurated uh, on the fateful day. So I think that uh, the, this is all driven uh, by the desire to have some kind of a modus vivendi within the region. That's very interesting. And you've written recently about the fact that India has got, uh, you know, a relationship with, uh, budding relationship with Armenia. Uh, as where, where uh, you know, as opposed to Azerbaijan, which supports uh, Pakistan uh, on the Kashmir issue and so on and so forth, uh, and and even uh, you know, uh, I mean, the fact that Armenia backs India on Jammu and Kashmir, and as well as the UN Security Council seat, does India have an Armenian connect? I mean, uh, you've uh, you've you've said that there's much more to, and it's a growing relationship. Well, Iran also has very good relationship with Armenia, as you know. Uh, so That's one right. relationship should not um, obviate the relationship with another country. That is what they are trying mm -hmm. to work on. As far as India's relations with Armenia are concerned, they're a very historic relationship. It's not from now. You know, the Armenian church came into India. A lot of Armenians lived in Calcutta and they still do quite a few of them. And India earlier used to work through the Soviet Union because they were part of the Soviet Union. So their relationship was continuing with that. But then now we have seen, and you rightly mentioned that uh, whether it is Turkey, whether it is Azerbaijan, or whether it is Pakistan, they have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, positions on core interests of India, uh, which looks inimical to India's interests. Even though um, we, our trade with Azerbaijan is over $10 billion, almost 10 times that of uh, with, the, with Armenia. Uh, so in that com economic and commercial relations, people to people connect, uh, the, the India's uh, Bollywood industry, for example, is thriving there. So this, we are seeing a lot of connection there, but at the same time, the political level, there have been hesitations. And uh, India is looking at uh, to become um, one of the major exporter of arms and ammunition. And Armenians have been That's wanting true. to buy it from us. So India has developed this defense and security partnership, which of course has the other factors in the neighborhood uh, as a part of it. That's very interesting. If I can just go back to Ibrahim Raisi and his, you know, shock uh, death. I mean, how has that going to affect India-Iran relations in the future? I mean, I know there is uh, the theocracy in uh, Iran will will, uh, will 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 I mean, they will elect and nominate, uh, you know, a successor uh, in due course in the next couple of weeks uh, by the third week of June. But what does it mean for India? Was it uh, was it a a relationship with uh, which went beyond Raisi, and uh, do we have uh, what kind of connect do we have with uh, Tehran? And, see, and also, uh, if you can just talk us through the uh, the tricky relationship that we now have to uh, you know sort of manage with our uh, the, the relationship that uh, the Prime Minister Modi uh, you know has forged with Benjamin Netanyahu, and uh, you know now of course with the with the Chabahar fort uh, becoming a, you know, a kind of an anchor, anchoring mm -hmm. our uh, relationship. Well, the fundamental thing is that uh, India and Iran have this uh, civilizational and uh, cultural connect, and historic connect for quite some time, for a long time, as you know. The Persian culture is very much influencing in India. Um, we have had uh, exchanges all along with Iran. Iran is a very major power in the region. And therefore, India's strategic partnership has continued with them. It is only when the, they came under the U.S. sanctions uh, that certain stress began to be felt uh, in the relationship. Despite that, we have seen that the highest political level, uh, the visits have taken place, the meetings have held, 
uh, I mean, from India, as you know, the Prime Minister Modi, if we were to go to 2016, uh, he went to Iran and um, the the trilateral agreement with Iran, Afghanistan, and India was also signed. Uh, Chabahar Port, this 10-year agreement, which has now been signed, was actually initial during his visit, the main agreement. Now it's a contract signed. So a Chabahar Port, they offered to us in 2002, actually. Uh, during That's the right. visit of the Prime President of Iran to India, thereafter 2003. But due to sanctions, due to, I would say, stasis on our part, we did not really capitalize at that point. Uh, but it is only in 2016, after the visit, that things started moving. But, and also at that time, you know, that uh, the Obama administration was trying to ease sanctions on Iran after the signing of the uh, nuclear deal uh, with Iran. And so this was an opportune moment for India to really enhance its ties uh, and uh, get over the sanctions regime. And we were given um, the various exemptions, even for import of oil from Iran for some time. And Chabahar port was essentially kept out of the purview of the sanctions for that period. So yeah. India continued, took over the management. The that was, yes, at that time it happened only for yearly basis. And the, just recently on May 13, the deal that we have signed is for 10-year contract for the first but time. And obviously, so what you're saying is that it is it, Chabahar doesn't define India-Iran relations; that it goes way beyond that, and uh, that we have. So, what, it is an is important uh, it is an important pivot in the relationship, I would say, because it provides yeah. you the connectivity to Afghanistan and to Central Asia, which is very critical for India's uh, outreach in the That's Eurasian right. region. Yes. That's right. So what now, Ambassador? Yeah, what another thing you asked old? about uh, relationship with uh, Israel. Now, yes. both Israel and Iran and Arab countries, they all understand that India will continue to have its relations with all the countries. That's why we call some policy called dehyphenation. So each relationship stands on its own. Wherever possible, India tries to help in, uh, you know, decelerating the tensions. Uh, but where it is not possible, they continue to have on their bilateral formats. So to that extent, there is no problem. I mean, we don't see, but the fact is for India, the whole region of West Asia is extremely critical and crucial for our own strategic interest and stability. So therefore, security and stability of the region is very important to us for obvious reasons, which are three E's, as I say. One is energy security, the economy, the expatriates, so India is very much invested in this region in that sense of the term, which we call as our Act West policy. And yet, you know, India was being one of the first countries to recognize Palestine, uh, you know, is now, now there seems to be a big uh, hoo-ha about the fact that Norway and uh, Spain and Ireland are set to recognize, uh, you know, uh, Palestine as a, as a state, you know, uh, where does that leave us again? I mean, we, are we are we as trusted? Uh, you know, the Palestine the Palestinians that once upon a time believed that you know we were uh, we would we backed them wholly. Do we have the same kind of relationship with Palestine as uh, in the present time as we did in the past? Because I mean, given our uh, closeness to Israel. Well, Inaji, I would like to say that um, as I mentioned, let me try to explain dehyphenation. You know, earlier our policy was entirely dependent uh, on the uh, our interest with the Arab world. And since 1992, when we established diplomatic full diplomatic relations, I would say, with Israel, it's 30 years, uh, 32 years now. Uh, but the relationship with Israel is a strategic partnership which is going on, and all these countries know. I can share some exam some anecdote with you on this. Yeah, I was the desk officer at the time. I was a desk officer in 1992 in the ministry. And then when we met Arafat, Yasser Arafat at the time, and we told him that because, see, there was Oslo Accords and everything else was happening. So when we told him that we are also thinking of normalizing ties, he was very happy about it. He said, you know, you are our brothers, friends. And if you normalize ties, it's a good thing, because then you will be able to put sense, some sense into the Israelis with regard to the Palestinian state. Really? So that has been going on. Now, in 2000. 15, I was ambassador to Jordan when we organized the visit of the President uh, Mukherjee there. Then he went to Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. Now, that used to be the normal pattern. Today, what has happened is India is assisting uh, Palestine a great deal. We, in fact, built their embassy, as you know, here in Chanakya Puri. 
completely. We are providing them budgetary assistance. We have provided them all kinds of capacity building assistance. And even to UNRWA, we have upgraded our uh, uh, support to $5 million from $1.5 million, the rest of the world has been curtailing it. So India's oh. support to a cause of Palestine remains, um, I would say, undiluted. Uh, we want the dialogue to happen. We want two-state solution whereby Palestine, a sovereign, viable state of Palestine, is side by side with Israel in peace. That's what India wants, and India is ready to provide its uh, facilitation. As you know, Prime Minister Modi recently said that uh, he had sent a special envoy uh, to Israel during Ramadan to stop uh, the war and told Israelis that much. So India is doing what it can, but it is maintaining its relations both with Israel and with Iran. In the same way, we are not getting into their internal problems, but we are supporting the right cause. Now, India has been against the settlements. You know, everywhere, whenever there was a, a vote in the UNGA, India has opposed to settlements by Israel in the uh, West Bank. So West on Bank, the matter yeah. of principle, India remains. So therefore, India is the only country probably other than the regional, some regional countries, which are trusted both by Israeli Palestinians and the Arabs. Uh, till today, that is the case that remains there. What about these uh, this other development where the international, uh, you know, criminal court has, uh, you know, threat has basically filed these charges against uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Galan, as well as Hamas, uh, you know, uh, Hamas leaders Yahya Shinwar and Mohammed Dave and Ismail Haniya. They're going to be facing prosecution for war crimes, is what they're saying. What do you see happening? I mean, is that is that a serious uh, development? Yeah, firstly, um, the ICC is not, uh, I mean, uh, the USA, India and Israel are not members of the ICC. That is one thing. But ICC is an international organization. And you know that uh, when uh, they wanted President Putin to be uh, indicted and uh, yeah. Uh, warrants were issued against him. The United States was very happy about it. But when it comes to now about Israel or themselves, uh, they are dead against this organization and want to even impose sanctions. So that shows that uh, they, uh, the, in my view, the Americans are working over time to undermine the international, liberal international order which they themselves created. Uh, by undermining various institutions and not continuing with the legitimacy. But as far as uh, the ICC doing it, uh, whatever I have uh, read is that full, both Hamas leaders, three of them, and the Israeli leaders, two of them, have been basically indicted for different kind of crimes. You know, it is not exactly for the same things. So, whereas in the, it is known to the world that there are, uh, there, there are, you know, restrictions uh, on the supply of the humanitarian assistance, the bombardment, collective punishment, and all that, which is very clear. On the other hand, those three, um, the, the Hamas leaders, have been accused of very different things. So, but what is yeah. bothering the, the I think the, the Israelis is that they are being equated with the Hamas, which has been a proscribed yeah. organization Possibly. internationally. So that is the I didn't thing. think of that, yeah. But if you look at it, the there are countries like Germany today said that in case the arrest warrant is issued, and if Netanyahu comes to Germany, we will be forced to arrest him. So this is a symbolic, and those 124 countries. That's true. That's true. This, so they step into any continue. one of those countries which yes. are signatory, they will be they yes. will be arrested. You're right. Very, very true. Yes. Yeah. So our final question, you know, uh, you know, is is this whole uh, question that has been brought up now by Norway about a two-state solution. I mean, India has always uh, uh, supported the idea, but how practical is it? Because, I mean, uh, it is it is a question of, you know, of Israel and Palestine actually, Palestinian authorities actually sitting across the table and revisiting what was the Oslo Accords. Do you see that actually happening? Or, and, and the other point I had is, given the fact that India has such a huge uh, trust factor, I mean, there's such a uh, such a uh, sort of uh, the fact that the Israelis and the Palestinians do have uh, a lot of trust in India. Do you see India playing a role at all? Well, I think number one is that uh, these three countries, Norway, Ireland, and Spain, 
um, have taken this decision and which will be actually followed by Malta and Slovenia, I guess, um, to recognize uh, is, uh, Palestine as a full state. And uh, Colombia, as you know, has uh, announced that it will be opening its embassy in uh, Ramallah. So there are countries in Latin America and there were 140 countries have already recognized uh, Palestine. That's right. Now, yeah. recently, uh, we had this in the UNGA, I think on 13th May or something, there was a, a resolution by the UNGA in which they asked that this should be, again, uh, considered by the UN Security Council because the previous resolution was vetoed by United States while supported by 13 countries and the UK abstained on it. So this is, they have again come back, they're in the, in the very big majority actually, uh, to support that uh, Palestine should become uh, a state. Now, that yeah. most countries feel that this recognition may not de facto, uh, may create an issue, but it will create uh, steps for a de jure uh, settlement of some kind of a two-state solution. Israel obviously has denounced it completely uh, that these countries have gone, they have called back their ambassadors. So I think that this is going to be a difficult uh, way going forward because Israel feels that this is like rewarding the terrorists. Yes, because Hamas is that. still not destroyed completely. As far as India's role is concerned, I think that uh, India does try to take the backside role, basically. You know, uh, wherever they require, I think that we talk about it, that there should be a dialogue, direct dialogue between the two countries as far as possible. And they should arrive at a situation. But I have a feeling that with the present status of the territorial uh, distribution uh, between the West Bank, which is very little left now, you imagine that 1948, it was 55% of the territory was given to Israel and 45 to the uh, Arabs, uh, the Palestinians. That's why the wars took place, those three or four major wars, they did not accept it. Israel accepted to become... Including uh, the 1953 yes, war, right? 48. Where yes, 56 well, yeah. and 48, 56, 73 and 67. So there are four wars that have happened between Arabs. But now, six or seven times, we have seen the war is happening between Israel and Hamas. Now, this war has already gone on for eight months now. And a lot large number of casualties have taken place. The whole world, including the United States, is looking uh, for somehow bring about some kind of a truce or ceasefire so that the hostages, 128 hostages, which are with the Hamas, could be uh, released. So that's something there in India has also always asked for that release of the hostages is a must. And, but on the Palestinian issue, there has to be a true dialogue and diplomacy that the both must talk. Go, going back to, uh, you know, Raisi's uh, hardline, the fact that the uh, theocracy uh, is, uh, you know, very clear about the fact that Israel is the enemy in the region. Uh, do you see any attempt to water down uh, the uh, sort of attacks that are being stepped up right now. Uh, I mean, especially in southern Lebanon, uh, where the Hezbollah has, uh, you know, has, uh, has been raining missiles on, 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 the, uh, on that Israeli area, the Valley of Tears or whatever it's called. And what else uh, can we expect from the current regime? Or, because, I mean, there, there will be some kind of, uh, you know, time that they will take to recalibrate and uh, look at where this uh, Gaza offensive is going? I think there will be a wind of change in the Iranian, as I said, in the foreign policy or the internal issues, even with the smooth transition of power, even when the new president will take over, because this is a very, and then the, 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 the system in Iran is such that the government will run and the, there is no question of any threat to the establishment in Iran. That's one of the issues. The second issue is Gaza war on uh, Israeli war on Gaza is not being accomplished yet by the Israelis. And everything is linked to the uh, cessation of hostilities by Israel. But the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is determined to expel all the Palestinian 1.5 million people in the south of the Gaza Strip where they are in, Jab in, in Rafah. Uh, and they wanted to invade that portion and expel them out because ethnic cleansing has to continue, Nina. From 1948 till date, it has not been accomplished by the Israeli government to annihilate the whole of Palestine. And they wanted to kick the Hamas, but everybody says, if you wanted to take Hamas out, you could shift the Palestinian into the occupied territories and take on Hamas. 
But the objective, of course, is not Hamas. It is the Palestine itself. So therefore, everybody, even the Houthis, the Yemenis, have already, Ansarullah, said that, that we will stop our attack on Israel and on the ships going to Israel if the Israelis stop the war on Gaza, which is not stopping. And even the Hezbollah said the same thing. And but I think is, they have changed is... the rule of engagement with Israel on that yeah. So what, what, what is driving uh, Israel to continue the Gaza offensive? Because, you I mean, you have, uh, you've got now two very interesting developments that have happened in the, in the last 24 hours. You've got, uh, you know, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel's Defense Minister, Yov Galan, as well as the Hamas leaders, you know, Yaya Sinwar, Mohammed Deif, who lives in the UAE, and Ismail Haniya, all facing prosecution for war crimes uh, by the International Criminal Court. And it has far more teeth, uh, the ICC, than the International Court of Justice. Uh, you know, what, uh, what, what do you see are, are going to be the repercussions of that? I mean, is that the, it's, it's not going to stop Israel from committing the, uh, you know, the, uh, the continuing with their uh, uh, offensive in Gaza. But this is very serious because it's the Hamas guys have been charged as, as well as Israel's uh, top leaders. Yes, but but I don't think Israel will 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 abide by any rule. Israel is the outcasted country, which is have the full support of the United States, and the exceptionalism and unilateralism job done by the Israelis they always get the support of the United States, justifying every steps of it. That is why the whole world is angry. Even the United States has been isolated globally because of its position. Even the street of the Western here can notice all this demonstration in the university among the youth who are wanted to yeah. end this genocide because this is a genocide. It's no more an attack or a revenge attack against the Hamas who have been done on the 7th of October against the Israelis. It is more to do with the Palestinians. How can you see all these dead bodies and the depressed and crying and you're killing more than 25,000 children, at least according to UN figures. And the it's women. not the figure. 35,000 people have died, 100,000 have been injured, and you're causing starvation and, and every plight of the Palestinian suffering continues. And you still wanted this country to abide by international law. I mean, they are unable even to stop Israel from this attack or make any aids to come to the Palestinians. So I don't see uh, Netanyahu is in a deep trouble uh, internally. What is, because what people... is the, can you can you can you tell our viewers okay, what what kind of trouble he's facing? Because now I, I believe that the uh, that there is a huge rift within his government between the right wing and the uh, you know middle of the roaders. The people who I want think, these hostage negotiations to be given, uh, you know, prominence rather than an attack on Gaza. Absolutely. I think this is the weakest government that Netanyahu have ever taken over as a prime minister. And it is all with the right wing, right extreme extremists of the Israelis uh, parties who does not believe in any Palestinian state, who does not believe that there are Palestinians in Palestine. They believe it's only Israel and it is only a Jewish state. So therefore, they wanted to drive out the Palestinian. So he is surviving on the demand of those right-wing extremists who wanted to annihilate the whole of Palestine. This is one. The second part also, people in Israel started demonstrating to us, the prime minister, before it was only because of the they wanted to the, the prisoners. Now they're calling because he is also uh, having lots of corruption cases. There are internal problems against him. He's been accused of siphoning $50 million out of the Qatar money went to Hamas out of the $200 million he has given to Hamas. So these are internal issues of the uh, Israelis. So everybody says, as long as he continue with the war, there is no question that he will be taken to the prison. But the moment the war stops, it, he will be go to the prison. So therefore, for Netanyahu, it is good that the war is widened and regional war. That's why he tried to drag uh, Iran into the war along with the United States, but it was stopped till now. Now, uh, now North Lebanon, uh, North uh, South of Lebanon is also under attack, which is going to be the next uh, steps, and also all this frontier. So unless and until he stopped the war, there is no question that he will collapse immediately. He has to collapse. His government has to collapse. So internal turfs and among the people of this uh, government, among the parties in this government, it clear it shows that there is no one who is taking no objective of this war. Where are you taking Israelis? Is it Israeli to the dark ages or you're taking the Palestinian? Because at the end of the day, Israel's survival also is, has to be uh, coexistence with the Arabs. 
with the neighbors, with the Palestinians. You can't survive on an isolated world and on your own by killing everybody surrounding you. So where are you driving the Israeli people? I think it is a sensible leader of Israel is required, like Rabinus, and who can be uh, sit down and discuss a peace deal with the Arabs and with the Palestinians to end this mess and implement, implement the UN Security Council resolution. Annihilation of Palestine, expansions of the settlement, continue occupation, these are the crux of the problem. And I think Israelis recognize, and Netanyahu, by going into the deep of Gaza Strip and getting all these prisoners, Israeli prisoners killed, he is also, you know, putting his, uh, his, his future at risk. That's true. He's putting his, uh, his own self-interest above uh, national interest is what it looks like. Uh, and he's, Israel is in the process of getting more and more isolated. Uh, but, you know, there is also the second development, uh, Dr. Awad, which I find quite fascinating, even though it looks a little empty at the moment. For, for, I mean, I don't see the point of it. This so-called recognition of the Palestinian state by Norway, Ireland and Spain I mean, these are seven members, uh, you know, of the, of the 27 members of the EU already recognize Palestine. Uh, they're saying two more could follow. And uh, of the 190 countries in the UN, uh, you know, some 140 already rec uh, recognize, uh, you know, uh, Palestine. So what is this, the point of this? Because, I mean, I know, I remember how, how serious Norway was, uh, you know, with holding all those meetings behind the doors, black back door meetings with Arafat and so on and so forth, until they came up with the Oslo Accords. But that was in 1993. So, yeah. I mean, since then, there's been nothing. I mean, the Oslo Accords have just died. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the, the two-state solution which, they, which they're now talking about is still not acceptable, is it, to the Palestinian Authority? Because it's a very truncated uh, Palestine that they will be given. Uh, you know, where even even East Jerusalem isn't going to be uh, shared. Uh, Jerusalem is not going to be accepted as a shared capital because the right-wingers want uh, Jerusalem. So do you think uh, that the, uh, this idea that Norway has come up with, what is the point behind it? If you could explain that to our viewers, that would be really good. Well, you said it yourself, 146 country out of 193 in the UN members are already recognizing Palestine. The Western world have already taken the, the version of Israeli version of the Palestine. And after Oslo agreement, we have already agreed that Israel and the paper and the paper signed with the Asar Arafat that five year interim period after that, the state of the Palestine should become viable. But even Netanyahu, he torn the Oslo agreement, threw it in the dustbin, got one of his activists killing the prime minister who signed that accord, Rabin. He was killed by one of his supporters, right-wing extremists. Yeah. And after all these things, he never wanted to have a solution. The whole world talking uh, the rhetoric about two-state solution. Okay, 1947, the division of Palestine, recognizing of Israel, establishing of Israeli state. Where is the Palestinian state? And all the world exactly. saying, yes, there has to be a Palestinian state. After seeing the masses and the, the, the killing and the genocide happening on the Palestinian, people start recognizing you are living in the social media platform. It's no more that people were getting killed and you could, you know, deceive the public. Uh, no, 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 they are killing us. They want to throw us to the sea. Now people see with their own eyes, with their own mobile, with their own TV and every show that how many people getting killed. So people like Norway or Spain or our island cannot, uh, you know, be an uh, innocent witness to what's happening to the Palestinian. They have also to have reflect what is the street and public opinion that the Palestinian state be recognized. And that is why they're coming forward. And I think this is a, a huge a change in the European Union position on Palestine, which will be benefiting the Palestinian uh, state. And how, the how, exactly, how, how exactly do you see it benefiting? Because I'm in Gaza. The UNRWA has been, you know, literally, I mean, there, there's so many of them have themselves died. These are people who are uh, back to humanitarian aid comes largely from Norway, you know, food, medicines and personnel. And they're targeted. So how can Oslo, uh, you know, or, or Ireland or Spain or any of the EU, EU countries be able to change any of that? Because this is disproportionate force, as they rightly say. Well, I think that will add to legitimacy of the Palestinian state and the international law. When the Western capital come forward and recognize, it is also would give a more boost 
to the Palestinian cause because now it is an, a recognition of a Palestinian uh, state next to the Israeli state coexisting. And that is where the importance of international law, if we believe there is an international law. These are the issues. It is only the hypocrisy of the West. When it comes to Palestine, there is no international law. But international can be applied in Ukraine or against the Iranian or against the uh, Iraqi but not against you know, the Israelis. So I think we have to question the role of UN in making this happening and making us who, who lived that period for decades of fighting for human rights and for the uh, international law and for UN Security Council uh, Charter or UN Con uh, Charter. All these things have been in vain and it has been you know, a mirage when we saw what's happening in the Palestina. Can the world take a united stand at least by recognizing the Palestinian, I think this is a, a positive development and it will help the Palestinians in the near future to have their own state. So how, how do you see it happening? Do you see a, 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 a reduction of the talks that, that were there in 1993 between Arafat and, uh, you know, Isaac Rabin, I mean, where they actually had a formula and they actually came up with the, uh, you know, what the state would look like? Should, should this uh, recognition also come at the end of that negotiation rather than imposing it right in the beginning. I mean, wouldn't that be putting the cart before the horse, so to speak? No, see, I think the, the ball is in the Israeli court. If the Israelis wanted a Palestinian state, they would have told the American, hello, and whoever in the White House, we wanted to have a coexist with the Palestinians. But when they are still co coexisting only as an Israeli state, and they know that the uh, the president in the White House is hanging on the support of the Israeli lobby, then it is no question that there is going to be a Palestinian state without Israel accepting that it is occupying territories under uh, against the international law, and the Palestinians have the right of existence as much as the Israelis have. If you have already been subjected to Holocaust, why are you repeating the same Holocaust on the Palestinians? I mean, these are the mm -hmm. issues is Israelis have to address. 1992, when we had the Oslo Agreement, uh, Nina, in 93, uh, we saw that 55% of the Israelis were interested in a peace with the Arab. But when you give the government to a right-wing uh, extremist the whole public opinion in Israel changed, and the majority so the right in Israel wing were does voted not... in the right wing, right wing were voted in by the Israeli people. So you change it because you start demonizing the Palestinians, and you said they are not willing to have peace with us. You demonize Arafat, you said he's not a peacemaker. You demonize Mahmoud Abbas, you said he's not a peacemaker. But you were ready to corrupt Mahmoud Abbas and his government, and you were ready to create Hamas to, uh, to counter uh, PLO, but you are not ready to find a peace talker. I mean, uh, let the international community take a decision on the Palestinian state. It could be governed by Palestinians by themselves with the uh, supervision of the United Nations. But are you willing to accept a two-state solution? And what is the reality of two-state solution, actually? What is the... What is the... What is... What would a two-state solution, uh, you know, uh, translate into? You know, a two-state solution means one state Palestinian, one state Israeli coexisting in, in peace, according to UN Security Council. But Israel does not declare its own border till date. We don't know what are the actual greater Israel border from Euphrates to Nile. Could be possible because that's what even in their point, they put it that they want to chop or take and here Syria, Lebanon, north of Saudi Arabia, the whole of Jordan and the Sina Peninsula. Hello. We need. To, we are living in the 21st century. We are not living anymore in the dark ages. What people don't understand your intention and your objective. I think this yeah. is the important part. And you wanted to uh, Palestinian to live in ghettos, creating an apartheid world and making them uh, cutting the, their source of even living or their, their their line of supply of surviving by cutting the villages into small ghettos, ghettos, cantonizing it, and you are killing any solution for a two-state solution. All these things, I think, has to be taken in consideration if we have to see that the Palestinian issues has to be solved in, in a proper manner. If I can just go back to, uh, I mean, I, I hope, I hope to, uh, that for the, for the sake of the Palestinians and the Israelis, that they do come to some kind of an agreement on a two-state solution and that the, the, the Western countries and EU will push it but the, even in the UN, uh, Palestine does not have the right to vote. It has no, uh, the U.S. is, is uh, standing against that even, even, uh, even right now. They've made a statement saying that they don't, will not uh, allow uh, Palestinians the right to vote. So that's blocked 
in in a way. Uh, but if I can just go back to um, you know Iran and the Middle East and uh, and India, you know uh, our our deal the the deal that uh, India reached with Iran on Shah Bahar was preceded by uh, Raisi, uh, President Raisi visiting Pakistan, uh, visiting Sri Lanka, and also the deal, as you rightly said, with China. What is the most difficult aspect going to be for India going forward? Because, I mean, we have to now deal with uh, a new person, or is that, is our, is that, when they're talking about India-Iran relations, dating back uh, so many years with that that it will not be affected. What do you think? Does India have the smarts to deal with this new, with the new leadership? Well, uh, let me just give a small comment on your uh, commentary on the American position regarding to blocking the Palestinian recognition of the United Nations. I think yeah. the, the American, the, the, the emperor is naked. And that is exposed totally of the hypocrisy of the United States talking about two-state solution while denying the Palestinian right of existence. I mean, that is the question needed to be debated in maybe in another program, the two-state solution. But in terms of Iran and uh, India, let us agree on one point. Just, that, just a minute, but let's go back to the UN. I mean, 140 of the 190 recognize uh, Palestine as a state. Would they not... Uh, back the uh, giving giving Palestine the right to vote, and would that uh, would that head of the Palestinian Authority be the person who represents the Palestinian government, so to speak? Well, I think the recognition of the state is depending on the appetite and uh, five permanent member council. If the five member council, one of them, use the veto then that would be the impact. So the General Assembly will approve and approve that they are supporting a state of Palestine. But when it comes to, to the UN Security Council, it is no, we know who is stopping it. And that is where okay. the problem lies. Uh, in regard to India, India. Yeah. yeah, in regard to India, let us agree on one point, Nina, that India has been the natural extension of Iran for years, for centuries, till the Pakistan was created and then we didn't have the border with the, with the, with the, with Iran. But those relations were fostering all over the years. And post-independent, I think India had a very strong and a very cordial relation with Iran. And only after also the, the development recently, for the last one decade, we have noticed after the American sanctions and their nuclear deal and India expanding and becoming emerging as a superpower. I think these are issues India have taken in consideration to play a proactive role in West Asia. And I think India uh, consider Iran a geopolitically very important for it is food and oil security and for the diaspora of India and living in the GCC where you have more than 8 million Indians living permanently there and more than 14 million actually visit the, uh, annually to the state. So there is a 70 billion Good plus goodness. dollars revenue annually. So all these factors contribute to India concern of a stability in this part of the world. And I think Iran play a major role because of its geopolitical location. India is looking for access in the CIS market for Euro-Asia through the international north-south corridor, the, the transport corridor with Russia and European uh, side. So all that will help India in strengthening its economy, its trade, its, its political outreach all over the world. So Iran is a very important. I don't see any changes in any foreign policy of Iran toward India at all, whether with this president gone or next president, because these are decided by the government of Iran and it will be a permanent in their uh, cover right. in the, uh, and they will not do any changes to change the policy of that. So I think it, the honest is an Indian side because they always have been pushing India to come forward before the Chinese take over the Shah Bahar. And I think India recognized that one year contract does not work. So 10 year contract will definitely work in India. Period. That's right. If I can just go back to Arafat, I distinctly remember when I was researching my book on uh, Rajiv Gandhi's assassination, it was Yasser Arafat who actually flew to Delhi met with the uh, officials there and warned Rajiv Gandhi that there was going to be an assassination attempt against him. I mean, he was such a good friend of Mrs. Indira Gandhi's as well. Has that sort of changed, do you think, given that India has reached out in such a big way to uh, build a, a relationship with Israel, both on defense ties and tactically, uh, you know, uh, uh, and trade and so on and so forth? 
uh, do the Palestinians still see India in the same light that uh, you know that was that was looked at when Arafat was uh, was the head of the PLO? I think when we look at when we talk to elderly in the Arab world, they definitely see India eye to eye, and they see that there is a position of India from fostering this relation from the Nehru Gandhi and continue the relation on those basis. But the new generation witnessing witnessing the closeness of India with Israel. Maybe they feel that uh, India is not yet saying that this is, is changing or at the course of the Palestinian support by India. Because I think India was one of the first non-Arab country who recognized the Palestinian as a state. And you know that they have their, established for them their embassy in Delhi and they funded and they built the embassy for them. So they, they have contributed a lot to, yeah. to the uh, Palestinian cause. They can uh, share with the humanitarian aid and in the UN have been supporting. Maybe the position of India is a sliding down from it is affirmative position. And that's what Indian uh, people tell us. These are a pragmatic phase of the Indian foreign policy. But I think in terms of the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian future, India is still very consistent in its position in support of the Palestinians. Yeah. That, so basically the point I was trying to make is that, you know, Arafat was a friend of India's. And uh, th whether we still enjoyed that same kind of rapport that we do, that we did with him, with uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the current Palestinian Authority. So, I mean, in the sense, do that, will India actually shed its sort of, you know, where it plays carefully on both sides and actually speak out and, uh, you know, do what Norway has done? I mean, openly say that uh, push for a two-state solution. Well, we have been doing it, actually. Prime Minister Modi's statement, I mean, recently, uh, after the first one, the second statement was very clear. Then every time he had spoken, he had also sent the special envoys, as I said. In the United Nations, yeah. we had spoken that there should be a two-state solution and ceasefire should ensue immediately and release of hostages. So this is what India has been doing uh, openly, I mean, publicly saying that. As far as recognition of Palestine is concerned, we have already done long back, not now. It's been there all through for everything that is related to Palestine's statehood. India has always supported whether I mean, we were opposed to the Trump's proposal to uh, recognize Jerusalem as part of Israel, if you remember, uh, you know, in 2019. So I think there we have uh, we have taken very overt actions. But at the same time, there is no denying the fact that India and Israel have a strong partnership and uh, will continue in the security domain, in agriculture, and technology, and all those areas. At the same time, the peace in the region is very important. And we don't want That's this right. war to be expanded to other theaters. Because it is turning into a war between Iran and Israel yes. more than anything else. Yes. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I mean, I have uh, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's Thank a pleasure. You. And we hope that there is some peace in the region. Uh, no. Thank you very much, Dr. Abad, for joining uh, in this, giving us a very interesting insight into Palestine and India-Iran relations, thank you. and of course Israel's, uh, you know, a war on Gaza, which has attracted, uh, you know, has seen it being more and more isolated. But as we watch Iran transition from Raisi to his successor, it will be interesting to see if we see the return of a more liberal element, or whether the hardliners will entrench themselves even further and what that does to the proxy war on Israel, which is bearing the brunt of a growing international outrage over the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza, and how India, which needs to keep its trade and supply routes open, manages these very conflicted relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mia. Thank please you very much. Watch, Pleasure to be with you. Do click on, please do click on the Global Express uh, icon and watch the Indian uh, on the new Indian Express. Thank you.